Hello. Welcome to this episode of On the Mic with Mike. Today we're at McGill University here in Montreal and we're actually in the faculty club. Uh, we've got some amazing artwork and things on the walls in here. The history is just a mess. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be having a conversation with Michael Hendricks. Well, Michael's a, a researcher here at uh, McGill uh, who's been doing some fascinating work on something called C. elegans. He's going to explain a little bit about that to you and what, we're actually, what he's actually doing there with that. But it's, it's just an amazing career and an incredible level of excitement about being a scientist. So please join me. We're about to head into that conversation as we speak. So welcome to this episode of On the Mic with Mike. I'm here with Michael Hendricks. And uh, we're gonna be talking today a little bit about his career and how it's moved forward. But first, we're in this really unique room. This is the Maud Abbott room here at McGill University. Okay, like, you know a little bit about this. Yes, so uh, Maud Abbott was a uh, heart disease researcher and she was one of the first women to get a uh, bachelor's degree from McGill. And she was eventually a member of the faculty and everything. So. Uh, huh. She's honored with this room, which is, yeah, it's, it's all kinds of molding and... Uh, it really is quite yeah. impressive. Yeah. Now, I heard there's a little story about her sneaking into the men's um, uh, dining area. Yeah, so she was one of the first women to be allowed to become a member of the faculty club, uh, right. but they were segregated still for a long time after that. So that was in the 1930s. And it wasn't until the 1970s that it was actually desegregated that men and women Spend right. time in the same part of the club together. It's kind of a cool story. Yeah. Anyway, this isn't. A, sure. I'm here to interview you sure, and sure. have a little bit of a conversation <laughs> there. So, I have a really interesting background history as to how you've gotten into science. Uh, kind of, I guess yeah, a yeah. Torturous <laughs> route, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I grew up uh, interested in science and with science around me because my dad was a scientist. Yeah. I was in psychopharmacology, and so in a way, I've ended up somewhere in the same general vicinity as him, but. Um, I was not particularly interested in science uh, starting my undergraduate degree, particularly not biology, because I didn't like biology at all okay. in high school. And yet you're dealing uh, with worms. I'm dealing with worms now, okay. but like biology was not my thing. I liked physics, I liked math. But okay. when I started uh, university, I, w I wanted to be an English major with a music minor. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because I was just thinking about this and several people, uh, my dad passed away a few years ago and around then a few people said, oh, your dad is the reason I became a scientist and I really wanted to get into science after taking a class with him. Or really? something. And I, I lived with him for 18 years. I didn't want to be a scientist. So something exactly, failed yeah. to rub off, on, rub off on me there. Uh, but I took a biology class. Uh, you know, you have to take a class in the sciences, a class yep. in the, this kind of thing. So I took a biology class for non-science majors that I really loved because we went on field trips all over Maine. I went to school in Maine. Okay. I went up the coast and we went uh, into the parks and stuff. Um, and I decided to give biology a try after right. that. And when I took a class in uh, developmental biology, that really hooked me. And I was, okay. Yeah. So. All right. So how, like, how so? Was there uh, something seminal in terms of a lecturer? Like, or was it just the whole field? I, I had a great teacher, I think. His name was Kerry Phillips. Uh, mm -hmm. He's since retired. Um, but it was the, the field, and it was this idea of uh, the sort of self-generating nature of development and the self-organizing mm -hmm. uh, principles of the embryo, how you create these sort of, uh, orient these axes and acquire self-fates. And okay. over time and in space, I thought it was just a fascinating problem. Now, yeah. that really sounds like somebody who does work on sea elegance. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, which is worms, for those who... Don't know yeah. uh, for it, but one of the most amazing tools that have come along in developmental biology. So, were you before or after that discovery? So yeah, so I was undergraduate before the whole RNA okay. uh, revolution. Yeah, it was, right. so it was, I was it was uh, mid '90s, and then that was more late '90s. But right around that time was yeah. when Victor Ambrose and yep. Gary Rubkin were doing that work, and like you do microRNAs. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. the C. elegans was so important because it actually allowed us to actually track cell fate. Exactly, right. yeah. yeah. So that was uh, led to uh, the heterochronic genes, which turned out yep. to be some of the first microRNAs, and also to a lot of programmed cell death pathways, which became right. very interesting in terms of uh, immunotherapy and things like that right. as well. Yeah. So I struggle, yeah. like when I'm, you know, I'm talking to friends and they say, well, what, what do you use as an animal model in your lab, right? Yeah. And I talk about flies. Yeah. Right? That leads to the usual tirade of jokes about how do you feed them and all the rest of that uh, for it. But then to try and explain to them how such a simple model tells us so much. So when people ask you about 
C. elegans, they don't see C. elegans, they almost see E. work and worms. The worms, yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do you explain how it, his teaching is? Yeah, about? you have to be careful. It's kind of a conversation under the, yeah, <laughs> the it party. Can be. Yeah, uh, understood. <laughs> so I think what, what, what has made C. elegans so powerful, and, and it's why it was uh, kind of chosen by Sidney Brenner, was this idea that you could enumerate all the parts. You mm -hmm. could sequence the genome, you can track the entire cell lineage, and it's that stereotypy in development and in anatomy that makes it a very powerful system to detect differences in, so genetic differences and environmental perturbation. Okay. So if you know that the cells are always supposed to divide in exactly the same pattern and acquire the same fate, you can at very high resolution look for problems when that, when that happens. So in terms of okay. developmental genetic control, it's, it's extremely precise. And they can be genetically modified? Yeah, so a lot of these, um, these developmental genes are involved in the timing of cell divisions or the acquisition of fate uh, in various well-defined tissues. So if you look at certain parts of the worm, you know, an organ is composed of 18 cells that always originate in the same okay. way. And then you can watch under a light microscope and see when that goes wrong. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so it's uh, incredible, yeah. Now, how do you link that to your psychopharmacology interest? So this is it. That's the I, question. I, so I came into C. elegans not as a developmental biologist, actually. What happened was I was I loved zebrafish. And so that's why I did my okay. PhD. And I did axon guidance in zebrafish. And okay. it's a beautiful system because it's a transparent embryo and you can yep. watch the nerves grow. Um, but what I got interested in doing that is more in the function of the neural circuits and the behavior, in which case I thought zebrafish were too complicated. Too many neurons. Okay. Too, too, they're too fast. They twitch around. All right. Worms, uh, 300 neurons, always the same, always connected to each other in okay. the same way. So it's the only animal where we have the whole wiring diagram kind of of the nervous system. All its behaviors are slow, you know, it crawls around, it's quite, so, so these questions are really tractable and easy. You can go in and associate the activity of individual neurons and their connections with behavior much more easily than you can in, in a vertebrate animal. Or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So are worms sentient beings? So yeah, this, <laughs> so I, you know, I'm a no on that, but uh, okay. I, I went to a uh, summer school where I gave some lectures a couple of summers ago at animal sentience. Um, yep. And it, it, the point of the school is to sort of run the whole possible spectrum of views right. on the subject. And so there were people there who were arguing for okay. some kind of sentience. But it's an interesting question because I think what, what they do have is something that all animals almost have to have to be a behaving organism, which is systems for self-monitoring. Um, and I think this is becoming widely viewed as, as a universal, is that any kind of perception we do has to be integrated with our ongoing movements and behavior, if that okay. makes sense. We have to know what stimuli that we're sensing are resulting from our own behavior versus what's coming from the outside world. So that's why uh, my favorite example of this is I, I can't tickle myself because when I move my hand, I'm already expecting it before yeah, it gets okay. there. Uh, but someone else can tickle me, and that's the difference between reafferents, me pushing, and exafferents. Okay. It. But what's interesting about that is people with schizophrenia often can tickle themselves, and so Did this not know that. yeah, and so this yeah, relationship okay. between reafferents and exafferents that okay. seems to be a general symptom of schizophrenia. So auditory hallucinations dissociation, delusions of control, all fall into this failure to distinguish between self-generated and external stimuli. So how do you apply that then into psychopharmacology? Well, so yeah, it's <laughs> a good question. So I mean, this is, schizophrenia is a really hard nut to crack, right? Because it seems to involve so many uh, brain systems and no one knows the way in. Um, so my pharmacology uh, bona fides aren't yeah. there, but it was okay, <laughs> fair enough. But in the worm, what we what we do have in the worm are circuits and systems that do that kind of operation. They keep track of the animal's own movement, uh, allow it to integrate, say, the way it's moving its head with olfactory input, and okay. so it can tell which direction it smells coming from, or something like that. All right. And so we th think that these kinds of circuits are so fundamental to being an animal and the systems that support them are so basal that they're going to be shared across right. all animals, just like the cell biology. That's an assertion that it remains to be proven, you know? Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> you can say. So it's, you know, it's interesting, even just talking with you right now, and I you know, obviously did a bit of homework on you beforehand. Um, you're a gifted teacher, right? I, well, it appear to be the perception, <laughs> okay? But you, you seem to love the explanation, the getting to the, and here's how you understand that. Sure, right? and this is an interesting thing because we always, uh, we wring our hands over how we're training graduate students yeah. and postdocs and what we're training them for, but we don't train them ever really to do is teach, right? Uh, yeah. Explicitly. Yeah. Um, 
And, and uh, we don't really train them for any part of this job, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, <laughs> being, to be truthful. Being a yes. PI has nothing to do with being a postdoc or a graduate <laughs> student. It's, you're just thrown in. Um, and I was a little worried. I didn't know if I would like teaching. Yeah. Um, but I, I love it. And I think part of it is it keeps you really close to uh, thinking hard about explanation and things right. like that. And do you teach at the undergraduate level or more at the graduate? Uh, mostly undergraduate. So okay. I teach, uh, well, I, I was teaching developmental biology, which I love teaching. Yeah. It's my yeah. favorite subject. Uh, I don't tell people this often. I've never taken a neuroscience course. Uh, yet I'm on paper if some yeah, there you species go. of yeah. scientist. <laughs> but uh, the secret is it's pretty easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, development is hard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I really love teaching that. I gave it up to a colleague recently. Um, and I teach a couple of neurobiology courses, a okay. really fun lab course where we get to do optogenetics and behavior with uh, fruit fly larvae. Okay. And then a, a, an upper level seminar that has graduate students in it. Right. Yeah. And so do you ever think back to like when you did your developmental biology course, right? And that was the, yeah. wow, here's something I'm really interested in. Do you see that in most individuals in your class? So I, I would hope so. I don't, you know, I, um, I feel like development is such a cool field because it almost encompasses all of biology. Like right. everything that cells can do and things happens during right. development. And so much of our genome is for development and things like that. And so that's what I'm hoping even students who are interested in med school or, right. or physiology or whatever, I hope that they can get an appreciation of development as this unifying biological process right. and stuff. And I don't, I don't know how, yeah. I don't know if I've converted anyone to biology from English or music, but uh, <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> it'd be nice, yeah. yeah. So I gotta ask you this question because it was in part of the homework and prepping. You're building your own microscope? Oh yeah, that's a, it's my sabbatical project. So I'm on, okay. on, uh, on sabbatical and, and we do a lot of calcium imaging in, in one okay. neurons while, uh, while they're wiggling their heads around or we're okay. making them smell things, you know, this yep. kind of typical stuff. Yep. Uh, what we want to be able to do is to do it while they're freely moving, crawling oh, yeah. around that plate. And so um, yeah, we're building a little microscope that's small enough that it can sort of uh, track the worm as it moves around on a, on a stage and image the head and, and get calcium imaging okay. signals from that. And it's been super fun and, and a yeah. lot of learning for me. Uh, I think this is the kind of thing, so someone like me who's like dumb at computers and all this stuff, yeah. uh, it used to be this was, you couldn't do it. Yeah. But there's so much amazing open source stuff now. Um, so you can learn how to build an optical train. I built a light source. This, the software that does the closed loop part, like sensing yeah. the worm's movement and following is, is uh, I can use it with my extremely limited coding ability. So okay. it's really great that all this stuff exists now. So this is, so this is a truly nerd question, but I'm gonna ask yeah. it anyways. Yeah. So your own light source. Yeah. How does light influence behavior? Yeah, it's a really good question because yeah. it's like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this was, uh, you know, the two of the biggest tools in neuroscience now are GCAMP calcium imaging, uh -huh. which is, uh, green fluorescence, so blue light, and optogenetics, which is also blue light to, to yeah. depolarize neurons. Worms hate blue light. <laughs> so, okay. just in, they can't see, but somehow they hate blue light. Okay. So this is something that we're not sure why, but, okay. but it's intrinsically aversive. So we have two kinds of controls. One, we have uh, mutant strains that don't respond to blue light. Okay. And the other great one is that some of these uh, optogenetic reagents, you have to provide a chemical cofactor, all transretinol, that's present in mammalian brains, but isn't mm -hmm. present in invertebrate brains. So we have to supplement. Okay. So we can leave that supplement out and then the blue light, any blue light yeah, activity okay. we see is intrinsic response. Not to that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. That's my nerd question for yeah. the day. All right. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But it sounds like you really, I mean, you love what you do. I do. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I love worms. I, I, I get their limitations and right. they're, not, yeah. they're not pretty the way zebrafish are, but <laughs> yeah, well, flies, I gotta tell you. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think they, they have a lot of potential and, and you know, the, the history of discovery in that organism is, is pretty astounding. And I think yeah. it's because it does, uh, what's true of all animals is true of worms. Yeah. And it's in this simplified package where you can really pick things yeah. apart. From it. So if you were sitting here having this conversation with you yeah. as an 18 year old, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be disappointed because <laughs> well, that was yeah. I really loved uh, yeah. English literature. That right. I really loved music. I still love music, but I was very, yeah. uh, you know, my first couple of years of undergrad, taking music theory and history courses and taking yeah. the English lit canon kind of. Um, one thing that I liked science. I also realized that I, I really enjoy music and I play right. music and listen to music, but I'm not like talented mm. in music. Like I'm not someone who's like, you know, has has a gift at music. Okay. So that, that, that was kind of like a, you know, 
Fair enough. What are you going to do with that cover? But it, also, it also sounds like you've been really open to, hey, wait a minute, let's go down this pathway. Yeah, right? although um, I don't know if it shows up in your background research. After my undergrad, there's a gap. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but let's yeah. go. <laughs> there's a gap where I was, uh, I, you know, so I think I was kind of a late bloomer. I don't yeah. think I was ready for something like graduate school and right. starting a career. So I just kind of did stuff, you know, yeah. not, not academic, not science related. Uh, some friends and I all moved to San Francisco at the same time. It was like the 90s, so you have a bachelor's degree and a pulse. You can get a job. Fair um, enough. <laughs> I always feel yeah. kind of guilty about what our yeah. graduates today face in terms of career prospects. But uh, so it was a great, fun time, and I had interesting jobs, but none of them felt like they were pulling me right. toward like a vocation or something. But like you know, it's interesting because when I talk to you know um, young students nowadays or to teenagers, you know, who are kind of thinking about their career. You know, I look at how quickly they will have been through an undergraduate degree, you know, yeah. and, and and I worry about so many of them right now come in and, boy, I'm just going to hammer through all of this yeah. and not really experience, you know, kind of the stuff that we got a chance to experience as undergraduates. Yeah. So this concept of don't be in a hurry, right? right? Take some time. You know, if you look at median age of survival, anyways, you're going to be around your mid-90s. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, why the rush? Exactly. Right. And when I when I did go back to grad school, I was so much better prepared for yeah. it. Like I could uh, the sort of commitment and focus to work on something. I had better quantitative and statistics skills from some of the work I did. Right. Um, I had like a clear you know, self knowledge about what kind of work made me happy. Yeah. And uh, and without that, I think uh, I wouldn't have been sure that I was yeah. going in the right direction. For something like that. Now, do you have any kids? No. OK. Yeah. All right. Because I was going to yeah. ask, like, obviously, the influence of your fa your your father, yeah, right. Um, so there was a clearly you thought in time where it was like, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But now you're there. Right? Yeah. So yeah. how's that conversation? It was. I realized it's past. Yeah. But so it, it became really interesting because uh, it, it did become something we talked about science a lot more yeah. uh, than we would have, and and we were you know not in in the same field but similar enough uh, yeah. that we would um, you know I kind of started going to society for neuroscience meetings when he kind of stopped going. Uh, okay. But still, you was know, that at the thirty thousand people attending? Exactly. Work? Yeah. That's what we had there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was a really nice part of like the relationship later was right. talking about science and, and he could be interested. Yeah. 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 If you had to do it all over again? Yeah, I don't know. Um, things worked out great. You know, yeah. even that even that sort of the lost years in the period. That's, yep. that's when I met my wife. I did some really interesting things in terms of travel and uh, life and music and friends. Right. So it was, it was great. Yeah. So if you I'm, I'm think I know the answer to the question, we're going to ask yeah. it anyways. Look ahead. Yeah. Right. Um, let's make it five to ten years, right? Yeah. And then also let's make it when you're old, gray, sure. you're done, and you're sitting back and you're going, man, I did that right. So yeah. the short term and then the long term. What so so like? what I think I would do or what I, th what I think I'll, if I'll be glad? I don't know. Well, I don't know. So near to medium term, I guess, kind of depends on how CIHR success rates go, right? Fair That's enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That I do understand. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no, but I'm, uh, I, I love having a lab I, mm. I don't have aspirations to have like a huge research group or anything i feel like it's kind of beyond my capacity to okay. effectively be engaged with or manage yeah. but the, i have um six people in the lab now and it's uh, clearly uh, the stuff is spills out yeah so. fair <laughs> enough <laughs> so it could even be smaller <laughs> fair enough don't cut my grant um <laughs> <laughs> i don't cut grants so you're all right <laughs> um so I'm really happy with this stage in my career, mm. I think, and just keep things going. Um, I'm not someone who wants to work forever either. I think I, I'm, I'm, when retirement age comes, I'm right. done. There's lots of other stuff to do. Uh, we still like traveling when we can and, yeah. and seeing different parts of the world. And uh, I'd, it'd be nice to get back to having hobbies. That's something from the, you know, from the yeah. postdoc to tenure time, that sort of everything else falls, yes. uh, falls away. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that I do understand because it is that time period. Yeah, the pressure. And your wife's a prof as well, too, right? Yeah, she's in yeah. Uh, the geography department. She does uh, human geography and she studies uh, new master plan cities in the oh, Middle okay. East and in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So, does that give you, between the two of you, do you have an opportunity to do a lot of traveling and have a look at all that? So, or? yes. Um, okay. some, a lot of the traveling she does for work is kind of to construction sites in the middle of a desert. So, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's always a hard pitch <laughs> as a vacation okay. destination. But she's yeah. taken me to to uh, the Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, okay. to some parts of Southeast Asia. So, yeah. Wow. 
So it sounds, yeah, it sounds like things are going really, really well for you. Yeah, like we're really, we're really happy. I think we, you know, we have this, you know, hugely long training period yeah. in academia, and to come out the other side and feel like things are going pretty well. It's yeah. uh, my shoulders have relaxed for the first yeah. time in ten years. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, okay. so if you had a chance to go back, right? Mm-hmm. This is the question I ask everybody, yeah, almost yeah. everybody, uh, for it. And anybody, I don't care what the time frame was mm-hmm. or anything, who would you want to talk to? I have a hard time with this question, and I was thinking about it because uh, I thought you might ask it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair I have this, um, I, I often find that admiring someone's science and then finding them interesting as a person can be very different. Two different things. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd be almost worried to guess that it's going to be a yeah. huge disappointment. You know, it's always, you know, always, you know, don't touch your idols, that kind of thing. Yep, fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of really fascinating scientists. I think, I think someone who I think is such a fascinating scientist that she would have to be interesting to talk to is Barbara McClintock. Oh, and wow. The okay. discovery of transposons, studying yeah. maze. Because I think that's the single most astonishing feat of like inferential reasoning in 20th century science. Just right. to, from the data she had to go to these are moving around a genome is is astonishing to me. So for those, I so I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, right? so. But for those who don't, yeah, what was the fundamental thing? I, I get about the gene moving around, but what's actually happening? Yeah, it's so, so unique. It's so, yeah. So what's actually happening is sections of the genome, sections of chromosomes, DNA, uh, can be excised and copy or move to other parts of the genome. Right. And this is something like a, almost like a viral infection for the genome, right. the sort of selfish elements, although it's been uh, co-opted to have a function in, in many cases in evolution. Um, but she was studying this in, in corn, and the, the readout was all the variegation in kernel colors, so these very beautiful heirloom co- colors oh, okay. of corn. And so corn is a great system because every kernel is a baby, and so you get this whole population of okay. offspring in, in one ear. And so you can see how the genetics are playing out in a single cross. And just from studying the patterns of inheritance and looking at how these things associated with chromosomes, uh, she guessed that this is what's happening. And I think that is so, I got to tell you, that is really cool. I, yeah. I knew of the experiment. That's the first time I've heard it explained that clearly <laughs> to me. And maybe it's because you, you hit me over the head enough. Eventually, I will understand <laughs> something. Well, that was really helpful. Yeah. Listen, Michael, this has been a wonderful yeah, conversation. Yeah, great. Yeah, I really appreciate. It. I wish you all sorts of great luck. Yeah, going you. forward. And good luck to you. you. Well, that. thank you. Yeah. So that's it for this episode of On a Mic with uh, Mike and Michael. Uh, on this particular episode, I look forward to chatting with you again. So take care. <laughs> <laughs>